This is Datadog on AWS Identity Management. If uh, you're not familiar with Datadog on, Datadog on is a series where we talk with engineers about interesting engineering problems they've solved at Datadog and share some of the information with you about things that we do internally that you might find useful. And if you're not familiar with Datadog, Datadog is an essential monitoring and security platform for cloud applications. We bring to get together those three pillars of observability, end-to-end -end traces, metrics, and logs to make your application's infrastructure and third-party services entirely observable. I'm joined by two great guests today, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves here in just a minute. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, kick things off with Ben. Hello. Uh, my name is Ben Donahue. I'm based here in New York City. I uh, joined a few months ago as a senior manager on the Compute Cloud team. Um, our team is uh, focused on managing all of our cloud resources and provider accounts, as well as a platform for our secrets and token management. Um, all of these tools allow our Datadog engineering teams to move quickly and safely. Thanks, Ben. Um, and uh, now we'll go to Leonid. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Leonid. I'm also based in New York. I'm, uh, I'm an engineering manager on one of the teams that Ben leads. Uh, it's team for cloud resource management, uh, and we are responsible for our CI/CD infrastructure for cloud resources. That's kind of uh, data dog infrastructure is built on. Thanks, both of you. Uh, together, these guys are a, a huge part of the way that we manage workload and human identities in the AWS cloud today. And you, they're going to share just a little bit about Datadog's kind of custom implementation that maybe isn't so custom um, and how we kind of keep things secure and, and help folks troubleshoot as they, they navigate the kind of confusing world that can be managing identities in AWS. Uh, and if we haven't met, I'm Andrew Krug. I'm one of the hosts of Datadog On. I also have the, the pleasure of leading the security advocacy team uh, here at Datadog. And with that, I'm going to pass uh, the mic over to Ben uh, to just talk about how we scale identities at Datadog, because we're, we're actually at a, a pretty substantial scale. First things first, like what are we solving for here when we're talking about scale at Datadog? We've got over 2,000 engineers here. We're running services on uh, tens of thousands of Kubernetes nodes and hundreds of thousands of pods. And in order to support all of that, we've got, um, well, we're, we're doing that to support our users, right? So all of that scale is kind of advanced, please, um, to support our users. So we've got 25,000 plus customers, millions of hosts, and we're monitoring trillions of data points per day. So monitoring, analyzing, and making that insight available to our customer. So in order to manage our identity and access for our engineers and systems, we need to leverage safe and simple to use paradigms. Um, and we're going to talk about a little bit of our human access and our machine access methods for doing that. And I'll pass it over to Leonid to talk about the human access side. Yeah, so human access. So thinking about those engineers who actually build all the Datadog products, they build it on top of cloud. And to build it, we need somehow to access the cloud. And one of my team's responsibilities is to actually uh, manage human access to cloud resources and build tools and frameworks. How, how do we do that at scale? So I want to share briefly like our experience, uh, how, we, how we did that for a pretty large organization, as Ben mentioned, like few hundreds of engineers. So uh, on the next slide, uh, um, we have this like a high level framework. So the good news is AWS they did a really great job on documenting how they see the AWS infrastructure should look like. So they have a well-architected uh, framework published, which contains a great guidelines around IAM. Specifically, there are two big pillars there is identity management. This is how we do human identities, machine identities, and permission management. This is like a bread and butter of IAM, which are policies and policy language, things like SCPs, uh, managed policies, IAM binaries, etc. So. On the next slide, I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about like a three building blocks we use to uh, have human access. So we start with uh, identity providers. So that is very like industry common uh, type of system. So we use strong, reliable identity provider. 
um, for authentication uh, and enforcing like second factor authentications and things like that. Um, we rely on AWS Identity Center, which is called AWS SSO as well. Uh, this is to connect our um, those two pieces together, right? So AWS SSO brings those identities and deploys IAM roles in all our AWS accounts. Um, and we manage AWS organization, we have dozens of accounts. So instead of going and individually provisioning access manually, so AWS SSO does it for us. So that's something that we primarily build on top. So, um, and the last piece there is we leverage standard IAM roles uh, and we harden our policies to feed Datadog needs basically. So on the next slide, uh, we have kind of, it's not a one time process, it's a journey. So AWS IAM is probably the oldest AWS service out there. So um, we originally started with IAM users. That's what the best practice years ago in AWS is we have IAM users, that's how we get access. But as we scale, we moved away from using IAM users to have a set of standard IAM roles that have uh, short-lived credentials and that have very defined scope and boundary. Um, kind of our goal here is direction is uh, immutable infrastructure and have no human access. That's of course like uh, an ideal, but approaching that essentially like we are moving towards just-in-time access, which is allow us to give engineers uh, access mostly for on-call emergency cases, kind of break glass scenarios on a day-to-day -day operational basis. They don't have to have carry elevated permissions uh, because kind of the, the infrastructure is managed. So, um, and the next slide here, uh, kind of our small success story. So we track access requests through a ticketing system. So that graph here really shows uh, our journey through AWS SSO and onboarding onto standard roles. So we can see like a number of requests for access dropped dramatically. Um, yeah, so by a scale of probably 10x overall. Um, so that allowed engineers to be much more efficient and when they need access, they basically have it. Uh, they don't have to kind of craft ad hoc requests to clear like special policies. So that's probably like one of the biggest impact our engineers saw of like adopting AWS SSO. Um, so next I think Ben is on machine access. Love a good down into the right slide. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so uh, machine access, uh, we also want to minimize configurations and limit uh, leverage primitives where we can. Um, in order to m have a minimal configuration, we want to do a little bit of uh, a couple of things. One is um, we've developed an injectable sidecar container. Um, if you want to advance the slide. Um, this, this has made it pretty nice so that cloud, uh, cloud resources can get access to the things that they need and only those things. Um, we leverage namespaces and pod metadata um, to make those requests, so it's kind of baked in. And we also use infrastructure as code with Terraform modules for our users to more easily configure the AWS roles and policies that our resources require. So in order to do all of this and take advantage of cloud provider primitives, um, we've taken a couple of other steps which you know, I think one, one thing that we think about is more of a cultural um, philosophy, and that is that principle of least privilege. We don't want to give access uh, or greater access than is required to do the workloads. Um, do you want to move us forward? And I think the other two items I want to talk about here for primitives are um, AWS STS, which is, you know, a great product, um, probably not as old as I am, but up there, and something that we leverage to monitor uh, rate limits and latency thresholds and is a tried and true uh, security product. 
Um, the other nice thing that we get out of the box is instance metadata. AWS obviously has this available, as do other major cloud providers. Um, I think the interesting thing for us also is that our infrastructure is running on um, ephemeral uh, Kubernetes nodes. And because of that, um, we need to use a little bit more of a sophisticated method for determining what resource is requesting access to another resource. Um, if you want to know more about the Datadog uh, node, the Kubernetes node architecture, pre please see our previous uh, Datadog on where we just discussed that with Ara, uh, Adrian, and David. I think that was last month. So on an EC2 instance, you have a nice um, interface to a thing called IMDS. Um, and when I'm saying IMDS, I'm talking about the instance metadata service. It is mounted on the EC2 instance at 169.254, 169.254. And it is the way in which a um, instance can report back um, metadata about it or report it to another service. So if you advance, we can show an example call. Um, this is a call that one might make to get the host name of the instance that you're on. So you would use this with AWS CLI or an application or something like that. So you can see there's just a basic token being passed in, you get your name back. So once you've got that short-lived token, you can go ahead and make requests to other resources. Um, in this example, we're making a call up to S3 and getting a service or getting um, an object as Bill Withers. And that returns back because you've got that short-lived token that authorizes you to get it. So that works well when you're dealing just with EC2. With Kubernetes, you need to um, hoist that um, instance metadata service up into the node. And there's a product called Cubed IAM, an open source solution to this problem. Um, it gives you that IAM role exposure, similar to the native IMDS. And of course, we are, we're talking about V2, if I haven't mentioned that yet. We're talking about IMDS V2, um, which will appear in our security report later today. Um, so instead of accessing IMDS on the host, it gets intercepted by the daemon set. Um, and basically has the same behaviors and same access to the data that you would otherwise get if you were on the EC2 instance. So here we're looking at um, enforcing the least privilege concept. And by doing that, we can actually move this even further up. And so we introduce the concept of a zero config injected container, which goes directly into the pods. So now we've limited the scope of what the pod needs to know to that pod. And so with that same 169.254, 169.254, we can make requests to our secret store to make sure that, well, we're, in this case, we're talking about Vault. Um, if the, the pod itself has the Vault client, it can authenticate with Vault, get a token back, make those requests to the IAM service, get that SDS token back, and then go ahead and request um, other cloud resources, um, either within AWS or perhaps even on another cloud provider, which is pretty cool. Um, so we get all of this nice benefit. Um, we're using primitives that are familiar to other developers, and we've got the baked-in safety, which is really great. So I'm going to pass it back to Leonid to talk about some of the advanced IAM services and techniques that we use uh, to secure both the human and machine side. Cool. Yeah, uh, thanks for the deep dive into yeah the machine access. So for advanced IAM, uh, so IAM is a very large domain in its own, and there's, I wanna just share some like observations and experience we got uh, by managing it for the large organization. Um, so we start on the next slide here with kind of like a, uh, a con conceptual model uh, called uh, PARC, uh, which is a principle, action, resource, and condition. So that model is how AWS implements uh, their IAM 
uh, policies and how they think about IAM. So it's something like if you want to get into the mind of like how they did AWS design their IAM, that's a really great place to start, uh, like conceptualize this uh, model. Um, they also, AWS also published uh, two really nice sources about it. One is called Amazon Verified Permissions, which allows you to sort of understand if you want to build your own IAM system, how that might look like. And they also released the domain specific language called Cedar, which allows you to design your IAM systems, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so on the next slide, uh, I kind of want to highlight how we apply those in our CI-CD infrastructure. So to manage cloud resources, we use a GitOps uh, framework, uh, which CI-CD is a major part of it. Um, and the key aspect here, we integrate uh, checks for IAM specifically into that pipeline. So kind of following the shift left principle, we check for IAM policies, we validate them before they get created. Um, we also run uh, different validation frameworks like Chekhov. It's very popular for Terraform policy validations. And we also build something on top of uh, OPA engine, uh, which is an open policy ag agent, allow us to kind of assert certain things about policies. Um, so I have an example in the next slide here with using uh, IAM Access Analyzer. So, uh, there's a snippet that shows the IAM policy. Um, there was a problem with that policy. You might have seen it already. The resource star action star effectively allows all access to all resources. So uh, on the next slide, the example shows how to use IAM Access Analyzer service. Basically, here's an example using the uh, CLI command. Uh, what we can see here is uh, just basically send the JSON file to the AWS and they do the validation for us. Uh, the nice thing about it, uh, there is a pretty extensive list of checks, not only errors, but also warnings and security suggestions. And those are changing over time. As IAM evolves, uh, they suggest certain features is deprecated or they suggest certain best practices. So here, for example, there is, uh, uh, they return you a list of findings that, that define specifically what are the issues. And uh, what's really nice about it, also a link to documentation where to learn more about it. Um, so that's something we uh, rely in for every change we make to IAM policies in our CICD infrastructure. We show that in a uh, pull request, that comment from IAM Access Analyzer. Um, yeah, uh, so the next topic is something we also use that the last letter I came from the park uh, is a conditional access. So conditional access is, uh, it's a very clear way to uh, make your policy bounded. So you can reason about like wh what it applies to. And the good thing about it, it's done immediately in the policy. So when you're looking at the policy, you can see condition right there. So that's the point where you can reason about it. Uh, and the example here is shows the condition that requires that a user should have uh, a multi-factor authentication when they're trying to do anything like any API call, basically. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of the, the wraps up the advanced IAM section, so yeah. yeah I think um, if, if you learn one thing in this session, it should be that that condition keys are a really amazing way for you to increase kind of the specificity of those IAM policies. I think a lot of people are familiar with the principal access and resource, um, which are really obvious. It's like the the who and the what of IAM, but not the the when. And there are a ton of super useful condition keys. AWS continues to add these to the product uh, every year uh, to cover all kinds of use cases that, that customers can take advantage of. Multi-factor auth is just one example. Um, resource tags are another great example. IP addresses uh, are another great way to, to limit, but, but really it's just, you know, you really want to get to the, the place where you've put as many guardrails in as possible to, to ensure that that policy only applies when you really want it to apply. And one of the things that I, I don't think that we really talked about when we, when we hit the node section and one of the challenges in Kubernetes is that 
At the node level, those nodes have to have access to assume every role that the pod has to assume. So we really only handle a portion of the threat model with kube to IAM. If, if there is still an operating system vulnerability, if there's still something that allows you to compromise that node, you can still compromise the superset of roles, right? Yep. And that's, that's kind of an unsolved problem, which is why we still always go for least privilege, um, both in the CI pipeline and then using something like cloud, uh, uh, the, the Kim space, C-I-E-M, uh, so trust but verify that your, your policy is not dangerous in CI, but then verify when it gets applied to the environment that the resultant set of all those policies aren't still dangerous. And, and we're kind of doing both of those things at Datadog. We're, do, we're doing the continuous scanning, and, and we're, we're trying to do as many checks as we can inside of the CI pipeline. So now we're going to get into the, the kind of observability part of this, which we sort of hinted at as, as we introduced this topic of, of continuous scanning, is, which is, you know, how do we actually dog food Datadog security products to, to help us manage our identity and access on a daily basis? Because using our own product is, of course, like a principle of our en engineering culture. But I think we have some especially useful uh, features on the observability side, like CloudSim Investigator, uh, the CSM inventory, and the CSM uh, 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 misconfiguration detection, also what you might think of as cloud security posture management. So let's just dive in there. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to start with the, the investigator. That's my favorite, pro one of my favorite Datadog products, uh, just because my I, I use it a lot when I'm on call, when I'm doing like troubleshooting. And the way I use it is like uh, very specific. So uh, we use it to troubleshoot any access issues. So for like if people come to us and say, hey, like we have this tool, we run it, we got some access error, we don't know where it is. Maybe we don't even have a traceback anymore. We just like, it's just error. Uh, uh, the investigator product allows me to go and look up by IAM role or by IAM username when they run it, what was the issue exactly. And it's really great about it. It kind of stitches together when there's multiple IAM roles assumed, uh, which is in realistic scenario happens most of the time. So it's not just like one entry in the log, but I need to really connect the dots. And investigator allow us to do that and very quickly identify where's the problem and the access, yeah, it works for both human and our machine access cases. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the uh, where where we see like a lot of value from it. And I'm I'm always surprised by the uh, by the cool use cases that people come up with for some of these tools because I actually don't think of Cloud Sim Investigator very often as a, a troubleshooting tool. As a former incident responder, I'm always thinking about this stuff as a way to unravel the path of an attacker through a system. But I guess uh, this, this could be a super useful way to see, you know, did you actually get to least privilege um, that's, that's uh, applicable to engineers, or did you go too far? Um, and are, are we actually preventing people from doing the work that they need to be doing? So um, this is a totally unique thing that we have inside of Datadog. And because we sit in the log ingest pipeline for CloudTrail data, we can actually enrich these events in a way that allows us to tell a much richer story than a lot of other methods for doing the same kind of analysis where you would have to compute this on the fly or run multiple uh, Athena queries or, or something like that to, to tell the same really um, clear story. With that, let's, uh, let's kind of move on to the um, uh, CSM inventory feature because you know we all know that all security problems are really just inventory problems, right? So yeah, this one uh, I also use quite frequently now. It's uh, I really like it to uh, look at the inventory at scale. And one of the examples how we use that product uh, is uh, so AWS they deprecate sometimes some of the features, like for example S3 ACL access. So that was deprecated a while ago, and they essentially the AWS account team reaches back to us saying, hey, like. You need to go and like mitigate those deprecated features. You need to stop using those API calls, etc. Um, so that product, the inventory, allow us to actually go and look up what uh, services and what teams are responsible for these resources. So we can create Jira tickets quickly, navigate through like project project managers. So in a large organization where like the dozens of teams. Um, 
and like my team is responsible for implementing those mitigations that AWS asks us to do. So that allows me to very quickly, like at, at the coarse grain, like look up, all right, so we have like that many buckets we need to migrate. Here's the list of teams, uh, here's the list of services. So I can reach out and uh, basically uh, like very quickly, like understand what I need, the scale of effort we need to do. Is it like a day or is it like a month worth of project to implement it? So, yeah. So let's talk about the misconfiguration side. And uh, this is, I think, uh, this is a place where, where the Datadog product is really evolving into this uh, uh, cloud information entitlement management space or cloud identity entitlement management, like whichever you, way you want to say it, it's a four letter mm -hmm. acronym. But, but really what these things are all trying to do is they're trying to distill down um, dangerous access conditions, either permissions gaps, uh, indirect access, um, uh, dangerous cross account access. That's what we're we're really trying to detect is all of these things that could result in like kind of a devastating blast radius for for leaking a single credential. And I think what we've got on screen here is we have one of the coolest views uh, for identity and access, which is showing the relationship between the AWS resources and a specific identity. Yeah. Um, and and it's very cool to be able to see this because we can actually see how many resources are, are directly impacted, but also what the potential pivots are um, mm -hmm. to other resources inside of the same account. So um, it, this is something that I think is, is particularly useful. Um, and it also calls out, by the way, on the left side, and it may be a little small um, on screen, what, what resources are internet exposed as well. So you can see that really clearly uh, in that relationship graph as you're kind of diving through there and investigating uh, all the way from load balancer down to the yeah, role. Yeah. So from a risk perspective, I bet this is something that you're using on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we, we try to shift left and have those checks, but when we actually look at, it's nice to have this uh, safety net when like resources are created, we can still go and look and investigate those misconfigurations. And sometimes misconfigurations, they discovered over time. So that allow us to also quickly navigate to Again, like what team, what service, and it has integration with Jira, so we can quickly kind of set up this process in motion of like fixing things very quickly. So, and and the Jira process is is a brand new feature that actually just just was added that I'm really excited about, because we talk a lot of times that that automation is is kind of the the thing that we're all going for, right? We're, we we want to live in this ideal world where we have immutable infrastructure and. When we commit something to the environment that's dangerous, it just gets yanked out. But the reality in in most engineering cultures is that we're just we're not there yet, um, and most teams need to follow the same workflow they follow for planning, scheduling, and implementing work uh, that they're already uh, yeah, kind of exactly. going through. So having that one click, let's open a Jira ticket, and also let's propose a fix yeah. in the Jira ticket. Um, I think that's that's generally useful for almost everyone. Um, you know, regardless of whether or not you use Jira, you probably have some other ticketing system or workflow you can attach that to. Yeah, it's it's very nice, especially like my team is operationally heavy, and we still try to like balance project work and operational work. So having that features, like we can quickly see right here is what are like misconfigurations we need to fix versus here are like cool features we want to launch, and then we can like reconcile the priorities there. And we we don't have it on the slide as well, but but one of the cool things I think in these findings is that. We actually tell you uh, the recommended least privileged policy um, as, as part of the finding. We also tell you the steps to go and group and remediate that. And I don't, I don't know if you guys experience this in, in your, your daily life, but I've found when you go to somebody with an engineering problem that's really cool and interesting, they want to decide on how they, they go about carrying out a solution. But if you bring them security problem, they want you to tell them exactly <laughs> how uh, they never have to hear about that problem ever again. So the more prescriptive you can be, uh, the more successful you're going to be. Make sure I do it the right way the first time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This is the way that you never have to hear from us about this identity problem again, regardless of whether it's uh, you know dangerous cross account access, indirect access, permissions gap um, type scenarios. Uh, so that I think it's very cool that we can just generate that level of prescriptive guidance for for engineers because identity stuff is is challenging for for a lot of people. You know, we're we're the human brain doesn't think in IAM policy grammar. Yeah, exactly. Right. Especially when they can compound, right? <laughs>
So we're, uh, we're just uh, running, running up on time here. We did get a couple of audience questions that came in. But before we actually move to those questions, I just want to remind everyone um, that, that we have a lot of open roles at Datadog. Uh, so you can visit uh, datadoghq.com slash careers to see some of the great open roles that we have out there. Um, and, and do you guys want to highlight any of the roles that you're recruiting for uh, uh, today? Yeah, yeah. I could throw a couple out there. Um, we're hiring for a manager on our provider accounts team. Um, this person will be responsible for leading a small team uh, that will be right in the critical spot of creating infrastructure and tooling to manage our provider accounts as we scale. Um, it's, it's a growing number. And we're also hiring a bunch of engineers, um, probably two or three. Um, and we're hiring in the US and EMEA. And that would be on this team and, and Leonid's team as well. So yeah, yeah. let us know. Uh, we can find us on LinkedIn as well. So yeah, feel free to message us. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, don't, don't forget as well, we have lots of great content on Datadog Security Labs, uh, that's some, of, some of which is identity and access management related. The URL's up there on screen. We'll go ahead and, and take a few audience questions now, the, the first of which is on the, the single sign-on work that you mentioned. Uh, so you know, could, could you just share a little bit about what that, what that journey was like? Um, and also, the, the specific audience question was about the condition key multi-factor authentication present, because you can't use that uh, with single sign-on, right? Uh, you, you can only use that with static IAM users. And shouldn't we be driving people towards SSO instead of static IAM users. Yeah, that is correct. So the, that the MFA, the condition was done before we decided to like adopting AWS SSO. But that was like for emergency scenarios, like if there's like certain outages in IDP or SSO, like I think having a break glass access to IAM users still making sense. So it's like defense in depth. It still makes sense to have those conditions everywhere where it's applicable. Uh, the journey to AWS SSO and like that took a while to implement, and um, we started with running like a dual stack access. The, the, what's interesting is like the legacy access RIME users does not conflict with AWS SSO, so you can have two systems of access in place and then slowly, gradually shut down the old system and reduce its scope, remove policies, roles, users, and kind of gradually move over. Um, to to the new system, so I think um, because they are not conflicting, so you like you can slowly do this migration. But that was kind of key, just like point in design design decision. Like how do we make it seamless for engineers and very gradual transition from like legacy to like single sign on. Yeah, and I th I think that's something that everybody is kind of struggling with is trying to move off of static IAM users to that that identity center reality. AWS has done a really good job of kind of separating the way that you bind the permission sets in SSO uh, relative to IAM users. And like you said, there's a huge value in the fact that you can duplicate yeah. those identities. Um, in terms of the logs, of course, you see people coming in through federation yeah. um, versus IAM. And so you get this great way to measure that over time. Um, and I, I think that that's a really helpful thing that you can also do inside of Datadog. Another down into the right graph. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, we looked at the investigator and, and looked at those metrics, like how like how do people actually log into cloud? Do they use a new way? Do they use the old way? And like we like just can reach out and ask like, hey, like you need to update your bash script to like use something else. This is another great question. That's kind of a follow up to that. Um, and I know that it's something that that we all struggle with. And and as as you mentioned today, we published Datadog's first state of cloud security report. Um, and without giving away too many spoilers, one of the facts in that report is that um, a significant percentage of instance roles across all clouds are overly privileged in a way that you know they might allow lateral movement or uh, privilege escalation. How do you go about right-sizing a role for a service? Yeah, so one thing, like AWS, they have a pretty fine set of roles. Like, for example, they have a read-only role. And starting with that and thinking about, like, how we, can we scope it down even further by applying some deny rules. But effectively, like, 
um, sometimes like we think about starting with no access at all. Like you just like, you don't have access. Like you, you have a service that has access, but there is no access. Like what is the minimal operations required? Like assuming the default is like no access at all. Like um, the one example about read-only is it's not always a safe operation, even a read-only, because there is a difference between making a read-only API call to like list your buckets or a read-only to like read the sensitive data. So even like a read-only is, is overly permissive, which needs to be scoped down to like what, like I think that condition in IAM is the key really is like, what are the specific condition that needs to be met for access to happen, but by default, like thinking about like, all right, we have no access, uh, like what, what is the minimal thing we need to do versus like we have all the access and how can we restrict it? Kind of like, I think from, for me, I kind of like reverse the picture in my head is like, I have no access, how do I like? Uh, how do I get productive? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if either of you have ever tried it before, but, but my favorite way to do this is actually uh, using the access analyzer feature that goes back and, and an analyzes CloudTrail. So deploy something with full permissions in a development and test environment and go, go back and look at that CloudTrail window to see what it actually accessed, and then that becomes the least privileged role. And that, that feature has been an access analyzer for a little while, mm. um, and, and I, I find it super useful, um, but just like, have you, ever, have you ever given that a try or? Yeah, so we usually like with that, we end up with very s specific policies that uh, like work in 95% of cases, but then there's 5% where like the code change a little bit. There's a new API call that kind of breaks the, the access. Um, so uh, I think it's a good start like to like iterate on it. Um, and it's also probably a good approach when you have a, a third party application, like a complex thing, you don't know what access it needs, you, but you run it, you see what it actually does. Uh, in like sandbox account or something like that. And then like on top of that, build a policy. So I think like in that case, yeah. Like. We did get uh, one question that came through from LinkedIn. And by the way, if you're watching on LinkedIn, thanks for being with us today. Um, it's our second time streaming on LinkedIn uh, this series. So we're super glad you're here watching. Um, and if you have more questions, definitely uh, keep them coming in. We're, we're monitoring all the channels that we're streaming on. Um, what are some conditional access policies that you typically implement? Yeah, so I think the biggest one uh, for, so probably not surprise, S3 is one of the most popularly used AWS services. Everything really needs a bucket if you want to do something AWS. So having the condition key on prefix or like a pattern of what actions can be taken on what bucket uh, that's one of the probably most common examples is like, is really like any S3 access, if there is no condition, it's kind of feels like uh, a concern already because like, uh, yeah, like it's, 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 that area kind of changes very quickly and you can end up with a bucket that everyone writes and then they don't know like which data belongs to with what team, what are the lifecycle policies? Uh, so I think having condition on like uh, S3 access, I think that's like a top one thing probably. All right. It doesn't look like there's any more questions that came through from LinkedIn. Uh, one comment, interesting approach to right size the, the application roles through CloudTrail. And it, yeah, I'd, I definitely think that's a trend that we're gonna see continue for least privilege, uh, right? So we've had a lot of tools at our disposal. We just haven't had the right tooling to kind of put it all together yeah. in, into, like you said, the challenge is a least privileged policy that actually works um, more than 95%. It needs to work 100% of the time by the time that it gets to production. We're using humans to close those gaps. And I think some of the other gaps have been things like Access Advisor in AWS, you know, didn't have comprehensive product coverage, mm -hmm. but they just added a ton of products to Access Advisor. So a lot of these things are going to empower building the tools that we need to generate those policies. So with that, um, I think we'll go ahead and close out the episode. Um, but thanks both of you for being here today. And thank you um, to all the folks that, that watched live with us. And we'll see you next time uh, for another episode of Datadog On. <laughs>